So, but, and the reason this idea of uh, the internet as, as a weapon, the, 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 the reason it's controversial is because we've forgotten the history of the internet and because its history has been obscured uh, and, and, and large parts of it just forgotten. And, um, and so in order to, um, to understand what the internet is, uh, we kind of have to go back to, to history because when it was created in the 1960s, um, the fact that it was a weapon, the fact that it was very obvious to people back then, this was something that was on the tips of people's minds. People talked about it, people protested it. And so I want to uh, focus on a specific uh, episode from that history. Uh, for, uh, this is probably my most favorite um, forgotten um, history of the internet because it's, it encapsulates so much of what we're concerned about now, and yet it, it has been completely shunted from our, from our cultural memory. Um, so, uh, so, <clears throat> so to do that, I want to start with a story from 40 years ago. Um, it's, it t took place in September 1969 uh, when a protest broke out at Harvard University. Um, several hundred people marched through campus and occupied buildings and refused to leave. A similar protest broke out at MIT. The campuses were papered over with uh, flyers and posters that um, denounced what they called, quote, computerized people manipulation and warned that a new high-tech colonialism was being developed on campus that would enslave mankind. What were they protesting? They were protesting the ARPANET, which is the, the military uh, network that uh, would become the internet a few decades later. From a historical perspective, these protests were incredible. Um, they, because they took place a month before the ARPANET actually went online. So the ARPANET went online, and the first node was uh, between UCLA and Stanford, and that happened in October 1969. These protests took place in September. So even before the network went live, there were students at these universities who knew what it was and looked at it as a weapon and, and talked about it as a weapon. They were not only protesting it, but they had formed a pretty sophisticated and, to us today, seems very uh, contemporary <laughs> uh, critique of, of this technology uh, and why it posed a danger to society. Um, so they saw the ARPANET quite simply as a weapon. Um, they saw it as an information weapon, a, a management weapon that uh, enhanced the power of the U.S. military and enhanced the power of, of big corporations to um, wield power um, domestically, but also around the world. Uh, and they saw this technology as a threat to progressive and left-wing movements. And, and so um, the reason they were able to have such a, a kind of a, 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 a prescient understanding of the ARPANET <laughs> and of the internet that they didn't even really know was going to, 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 to occur or to, to be born was that they were able to get their hands on a controversial uh, proposal uh, for, a project, for a project called the Cam Cambridge Project. Uh, it has no affiliation with the Cambridge Analytica. And uh, that, this, this proposal, this secret proposal, was uh, drafted uh, by J.C.R. Licklider, who was the the now kind of famous founder of uh, the ARPANET. He, he was an ARPA manager who was invited to set up the ARPANET program, essentially. And uh, the, the project that he was proposing that would be part of the ARPANET program, that would be plugged into the ARPANET, uh, was, was a kind of um, an 8-bit version or an Atari version of what Palantir does today. Uh, so it would be run as a cloud service on the ARPANET, so anybody who had, who had an ARPANET terminal and access to that service would be able to log into it. And it provided, uh, for, for, at the time, were sophisticated uh, database and data management tools and software that were remotely based. And so an intelligence analyst or, uh, could upload 
whatever kind of data they had, and it could be structured in a database, and it could be then manipulated and analyzed in, in whatever way they wanted uh, to, to, to do it. Um, you could upload you know, do surveillance dossiers, financial transactions, opinion surveys, whatever. Right? And then you can use that to, to generate predictive models, uh, to map out social relationships, um, you know, to create just searchable databases that would be available to anybody with an ARPANET connection. Um, or, um, you know, to do the things that we now take for granted and we just are a part of what, you know, computers do. Um, you know, and, and this, this proposal had a specific emphasis because it was, of course, a, a military a proposal and it was, uh, had a military aim. And its aim was to aid the counterinsurgency mission of the United States government that, um, that was dominating uh, uh, American military policy at the time. Um, and the idea behind the, the, this, this program was that it would allow um, kind of American military planners to, to, better, to, to, to get a better sense of what was going on in these places. So you could ingest, you could, you could ingest uh, data on, 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 on political movements, on uh, mix it with opinion uh, surveys and, and polls, and to try to maybe even predict uh, conflict or predict an outbreak of a revolution, and to essentially kind of uh, drill down into, into a population and to see what's going on and who's who. Um, and and to, to students at the, camp, the, this, the Cambridge project um, and the larger ARPANET system that it ran on, um, you know, they saw it as, as a weapon, uh, and they saw that this network that was being designed um, was a network of surveillance uh, and political control uh, and that it was part of a larger uh, trend that was happening on uni university campuses across the United States at the time was that uh, all sorts of weapons and military research was being conducted at these universities. And so they saw it as very much a part of that, and they were opposed to it. Uh, they didn't see computers at the time uh, as tools of liberation. In fact, very few people saw computers as... as, as technologies of freedom or democracy at the time. At the time, people saw computers as tools of power and tools that could allow powerful organizations, whether they're corporations or governments, to expand their power and to more effectively wield their power. Because those computers were huge, large, right? They, they were very expensive and they could only be purchased by these institutions. And, and so for, for people back then, it was, it was very clear that computers and power were, were in, in connected. And so the ARPANET was very much just a part of that larger fear. And um, they saw the ARPANET as, as a tool that would facilitate the centralization of power. Um, the students at Harvard and MIT demanded that um, this project be shut down and that this research not take place. Uh, of course, uh, they didn't succeed. Um, <laughs> and, um, but they turned out to be right. Um, they turned to, the, the Cambridge projects uh, went on for five years and developed a, a pretty robust um, uh, platform for, that allowed intelligence analysts to, to work with large data sets. And in fact, the CIA, uh, in, a, in, a, in a recently declassified memo, talked about how at the time, and this was now the early 70s, that at the time, the Cambridge project uh, and the ARPANET that gave access to it were the most sophisticated analysis tools that, that were available to a CIA analyst. Um, there was nothing better than that. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a Palantir version of, uh, of, a version of Palantir of the 1970s. Um, but then it got kind of a hairier because about six years after um, the protests, um, an, an NBC journalist uh, aired a series of reports on primetime television, uh, 1976, uh, exposing a, a surveillance program uh, that spied on millions of Americans and, and uh, took uh, files that were collected by the U.S. Army, illegally collected on American anti-war protesters, on civil rights uh, leaders, on anybody essentially connected to an, a left-wing or progressive organization in America. And they took these files and instead of destroying them like they were ordered to by Congress, they used the ARPANET and the Cambridge projects to digitize them and to make them immortal 
and to make them easily accessible uh, to the NSA, to the CIA, to the White House. And this was a you know, huge scandal. So he got three nights of, of coverage on NBC News. Uh, millions of people watched it at the time, and, um, and it, it went, the, these broadcasts went very deeply into the ARPANET, its, its architecture, uh, why, it was, uh, why, why it was a, an, advance, uh, an advancement over previous um, database technologies. And the, the, the thing that really shocked people about the ARPANET was that it showed that you didn't really need these big centralized databases, these big, you know, big brother databases that had everything about you uh, in them, um, because people were worried about, you know, the big, the one big government database that all your information is in. And there were a number of proposals to build those things, and they were all shut down because people were worried about them, uh, they, because it was just too obvious, right? What the ARPANET did was that it showed that you didn't need one big database. You could have a bunch of little databases, and it, what, it, what mattered was connectivity between them and the ability to easily access them from any, from any other point in the network. And so there were two things that were happening with this, with this broadcast. One is that they confirmed the fears of, uh, of the protesters from se six years ago. Uh, they, they worried that the, this, these tools would be used to surveil progressive movements and, and left-wing activists. But they also showed that a, a kind of an evolution in terms of the way that of the architecture of surveillance, in that you didn't, you didn't, it didn't need to be centralized. The storage of the, of the information didn't need to be centralized. And that all you really needed was a system that allowed access uh, to smaller databases distributed wherever they were, as long as they were connected to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the network.